Hare Krishna, Krishna Kshetra Maharaj. Thank you very much for joining again for the Monks Podcast. Hare Krishna. It's wonderful Thank to have this ongoing me series. Again. And you know, it's yes. on way to continue the meditation on the Lord in his various manifestations. And especially the richness yes. of the conception of the divine. You know, our tradition becomes more evident when we, have, we do a sustained meditation and think of the forms of the Lord each month. So, although I've known about Dashavatara since childhood, but I never really contemplated about them consistently or deeply. Uh, although we speak on mm. them in the festivals, but this has been a different and enriching experience for me. And I'm sure it must have been for, it has been for several of our audiences also. So thank you for making it happen, and by sharing your time regularly every month. It's enriching for me also. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to do this. Yeah. Yes. So this this time we're discussing Vamana Dev. Is that yes, right? Vamana Dev. Yes. So I thought of uh, just we could just go straight over the pastime, or you have some structure which you would like to follow. No, let's go over the pastime first. That's fine. Yes. So primarily, we can look at the Bhagavatam, although there are quite a few other scriptures in which there are descriptions of Lord Vamana. Mm -hmm. And this is among the few pastimes where it's almost that, uh, where the Lord and his devotee almost start as adversaries. And then eventually they become united. So I don't see that storyline in any other pastime as such. So we can't really say Bali Maharaj is an adversary in a, in a complete sense, but definitely it starts off like that. So that was one striking observation I had about this pastime. Mm. And so uh, now uh, there are several avatars of the Lord who have some devotees who are from a demoniac background. Most of course, most celebrated is of course, Prahalad from the background from Narasimha Dev, Vibhishan also. But it's not that mm -hmm. they had a evolution or a transformation that dramatic as what Bali Maharaj has. So it's, they're already exalted devotees and maybe their exaltedness becomes manifest at the past, as the past time goes forward. But in terms of, uh, we have dramatic transformations like say Rutrasur, but in the case of Rutrasur, there is no particular form of the Lord that he's associated with. Hmm. So, the, <clears throat> and another thing is that the Lord seems to transcend boundaries in this case, that you know he favors Indra also by giving him the kingdom, but he favors Vamana more by giving himself to him. By, Vamana favor, favors Bali Maharaj more by giving himself to him. So there are a lot of distinctive features of this particular manifestation. These are just some quick general observations I had before we go in. Mm -hmm. Would you like to respond to any of them or should we go into the pastime itself? Uh, well, just what you said about uh, crossing boundaries, of course, Vamanadev himself is, is a boundary crosser because uh, when he stretches for his uh, second step, oh, okay. um, piercing through the shell of the universe. That's, you can say, uh, a, a major boundary that he is uh, crossing over. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's so an external sort of boundary, but I'm sure we can think about other boundary crossings happening in this pastime. This is true. So you know, maybe that could be the overarching theme of this. So, you know, he, when he does that, that's also, <clears throat> do any of the other forms of the Lord have this much of a dramatic transformation? You could say the first avatar, Matsya, starts off as a very small manifestation and then he grows, like Vamana. Mm. But, but Varaha not, also starts very small and grows. Yeah. So Matsya and Varaha. It's interesting that uh, from here onward, 
the lord's manifestations are almost entirely in human forms so we discuss a little bit yeah. about the correlation with evolution uh, mm-hmm. in an earlier say but uh, earlier episode but so in a human form he comes as a he comes as a dwarf and then he grows into something which is ex- entirely and dramatically opposite to that of a dwarf so. <laughs> i something i've always not been clear about it seems he's a dwarf and he's a child so he's is he a, is he um is he a small is he a child smaller than ordinary because he's a dwarf or what that's that's fascinating i am surprised i never thought of that so we don't have any mention of how old he is it seems that he appears after the prayers of uh, aditi and uh, especially aditi and then he is given various what prabhupad calls birthday gifts and then immediately <laughs> he comes <laughs> then immediately he comes over to uh, receive charity from bali maharaj so it seems like yeah so he he seems to be born sort of fully manifest he's not he doesn't go through being a baby uh yeah. he's all there but then right up i don't know doesn't say how soon after that he goes to bali maharaj that is true but somewhere i thought i read that he's he's a child as well yeah as i mean i also have remember that and that's how it's uh, depicted usually in our pictures that he's a child so yeah. that's it's a good a question and so but um, either way probably the implication would be that um, he is he's smaller than normal height and uh, you know in some depictions if we look at the traditional temples he doesn't exactly seem to be uh like a child he seems to be like a now of course we may not necessarily say that it is uh, or those depictions are accurate but in some depictions it's very clear he's a child but in some depictions where he is uh, he seems to be more like a wise brahmana of whatever age mm. he is i'm just uh, looking at some of the depictions over here i think you can see the screen maharaj yes so Uh-huh. you know if you see over in pictures like this it seems that okay yeah. he seems to be like a not this one a fully f- form divinity yeah. so of course that is i think expanded form so if you consider this this is also an expanded form okay yeah. so if initially the it has seem to okay yeah if he has his is this with his parents these are they are different pictures i think this is with the sister I, of course we can't say how accurate these depictions are also so maybe this is not the best way to explore mm. i don't think we can take those pictures as evidence <laughs> yes definitely i think i'll just delete this part from the podcast uh when we display it anyway there there evidence well you can show um there evidence for how uh vamana dev is represented in recent years that's what their evidence for oh <laughs> that's a good way we don't have to discount it but we can contextualize it these are the kind of depictions that are there yeah. in recent times yeah 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 in fact i think except for maybe last few hundred years ago apart from the iconography on the walls uh, this kind of pictures of divinity are not have not been very common in the indian tradition isn't it from what i knew i think they started mm-hmm. with some kind of uh, development of contemporary technology and then co- uh, contemporary art forms so yeah, in india now we have print culture print culture uh, yeah. and 
print culture, what's also called print capitalism, um, print capitalism. Entered, entered India, you know, in the early 19th century. And uh, then you start seeing uh, these prints coming from, yeah, different artists and companies, especially in Mumbai, I think in the late 19th, early 20th century. Okay. And then it becomes what's come to be called calendar art, poster art. Oh, calendar art, okay. Yeah, there's one scholar who did a whole study of this. Mm -hmm. And he shows how it's not only reflecting history, but it's creating history in India. Oh. Anyway, that's another okay. subject. <laughs> that's amazing. Okay, reflecting and creating history. Yes, Maharaj. So, so either way, either it's because of his age or because of his, we could say, whatever innate nature he is manifesting as a dwarf. Now, as a, now that doesn't seem to, in any way, um, like shape his behavior apart from, say, drawing a contrast between who he is and who he becomes. So that means you know, sometimes uh, people who are very small, they might have some, some kind of complexes. So society might look down at them. But there's nothing of that sort seems to happen because he's so effulgent. Uh, Bali Maharaj sees him, Bali Maharaj is impressed. All the visitors are impl yeah. impressed. God so, does not have any complexes. <laughs> Although he's supremely complex. <laughs> Yes, and and supremely simple. Yeah, it's both. But Beautiful. of course, his smallness, his smallness, um, uh, highlights or accentuates the the smallness of his request. Um, his request yeah. for three steps. Um, Bali Maharaj looks at him and says. Come on, you can ask for more than that because he's so small. When he takes three steps, it's going to be nothing. Oh, okay. So, in a sense, it 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 adds to the drama of the pastime both ways. How small his request is, and then how big it, bigger form he takes. So, both ways, that form actually yeah. adds to the drama of the request. So, now we we already entered in the pastime. Just the quick backstory is that uh, that Bali Maharaj has actually become very powerful, although he had one time been killed, almost dead, and Shukracharya re revived him, and then got him to perform Vishwajit sacrifice, which is supposed to make him the conqueror of the universe, and then he drives the devtas out, and then uh, their mother prays, and then he appears. So there's a lot over here, but it seems. Till this point, uh, Bali Maharaj seems to be, uh, you could say, a, like a powerful conquering demon. He's not exactly shown as doing any demoniac atrocities, like say Ravana does or any other demons. But he definitely he has... seem to be evil. Yeah. So you could say he's expansionist, but not evil. Yeah. Yeah. He's an imperialist. Imperialist. <laughs> okay. That's a contemporary way of putting it. <laughs> imperialist. Mm. So he wants to yeah. extend his imperialism across the universe. Mm. Yes. And it seems and that colonize. Isn't... Sorry? He wants to colonize with his demon friends. Colonize. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so then he in a sense, it drives away the demons. With respect to Hiranyakashipu, it seems he has subordinated the demons. The demons are offering subservience to him, where they change the weather according to his mood. And he says that if I just glance my eyes, they tremble in terror. If I just raise my eyebrows, they tremble in terror. But in this case, they have just been rendered, uh, like in today's world, there are so many refugees because of political upheavals. So the devtas yes, have almost become like refugees. 
<laughs> yes, they, they've crossed the Mediterranean in, into Italy. <laughs> <laughs> crossed the Mediterranean mm. into Italy. So now, the, so at this point, Aditi prays and she, at the request of, uh, or at the direction of Kashyapa, so here also is an example where the Bhagavatam, if you want to cross boundaries, the Bhagavatam crosses the boundaries between what is material and what is spiritual. In the sense that her request is material. She wants the restoration of the kingdom for her children. It's not so much from what I saw in her prayer that she's actually worried about the universe and say dharma in the universe and she wants to establish the order. It's more of her she maternal concern. She wants to have her kids. She wants to have her kids with her. <laughs> yeah so and she wants them to be, be in power yes so oh, in that sense the rigid this is also example of how yena kena prakarena mana krishna niveshet somehow the other fix the mind on krishna if, or what is the bhagavatam verse akama sarva kama va moksha kama udaradhi tivrena yes. bhakti yogena yajita purusham param so dhruva maharaj is a classic example of that uh, where he gets a kingdom. This we could say is a little more selfless because she's asking for her sons and not exactly for herself, although it's an extended family. So, mm -hmm. and then it's interesting the way the Lord goes about restoring the kingdom. So, quite often the Lord appears uh, as a warrior and he fights himself. But this is, this is one occasion where now Lord Chaitanya appears as a Brahmana. Uh, but most of the avatars of the lords appear in the Kshatriya dynasty. And all the Parshuram appeared in the Brahmana dynasty, but still he fights the Kshatriya. So mm. Ram and Krishna and uh, Ashwadana Kali, Kali also appears as a Kshatriya. Buddha is a Brahmana. But then Buddha doesn't exactly fight. So... So here the Lord appears as a Brahmana and he gets very actively involved in, say, political realignment of things, rearrangement of things. Yes. Yes, Maharaj. So. Um, and he's doing everything in a very Brahminical way. Okay, yeah, he's going there, he's asking for chat. I mean, he, yes, his presence means, Bali Maharaj understand that, yes, I need to get some charity. I need to give some charity. And then he offers. Yeah. So Bali Maharaj, like you said earlier, is an imperialist. Uh, the point I was making is also that he seems to overall respect, uh, uh, we, if I may use the word broadly, Vedic culture. Although that word, what exactly it means can be a very broad ambit. But he seems to uh, respect the principle of doing yagya. He seems to respect the principle of giving dana. So, of course, even Brahmana, Ravan seems to have his own Brahmanas who give, who do sacrifice for him. So that's not uh, unique, but we don't really see any overt demon, as you said, evil or demoniac tendencies with him. Immediately, he's ready to give charity. In fact, he asks, what charity would you like? And he wants him to take more than necessary or more than what he initially asked for. So he doesn't come off as a as a typical bad guy in any way, except for the fact that he's conquering. He, he seems to be ex exhibiting uh, what in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, I think, Rup Srila Rupa Goswami refers to as uh, Dana Virya. Oh, Dana Virya, okay. Yeah, I think there are four kinds of Virya. And one of them is Dana Virya. The, the <clears throat> chivalry of giving in charity. Giving, the chivalry of giving. Giving chivalry. Oh, okay. And, but he seems to also be quite proud. He wants to show off that he can give. Yeah. And I think there's a verse which he says that, and after having received charity for me, 
a person should not have to ask anything from anyone else in future so hmm. that's there and again this is not a typical of a kshatriya that hmm. kshatriyas do seem to uh, for use of a let, for lack of a better word they seem to brag in some ways they brag about their prowess and that seems to say, especially before a war that seems to be a part of setting the mood for the war that they both want their prowess and they minimize the or deride the power of their opponent hmm so. but also historically because i've been re- reading about um uh, a kind of literary study of kingship in south india uh giving in charity show is, is one is they're showing their wealth especially by building temples the king is establishing himself uh especially by largesse and that manifests in concrete form typically in the form of temples and this is one reason we see these an important reason we see these very large temples in south india these are uh sponsored by kings and the kings want everybody to know that i have sponsored this temple oh okay yeah i i remember hearing a lecture of prabhupad where he, it's he seems to say this is a broader part of indian culture also he says that he met a Mus, he met a muslim who was poor and he became wealthy and now he is going to build a mosque so prabhupad was using that as a story as an anecdote to insp- uh, to encourage some of the audience to contribute to building a temple Yeah. so of course i think even ordinary citizens becoming wealthy wouldn't be able to build a big mosque but it uh. to be a part of a broader culture that even if and there is some wealth available one way of contributing to society and of course gaining a good name is to build a temple mm. so maharaj is this something which uh, you have observed in other religions also there are many cathedrals in europe it seemed that the church itself took the initiative and then they got into some controversy like selling indulgences are specific cathedrals attributed to specific uh, members of the nobility or specific kings well i'm no historian of uh <laughs> european okay. uh uh church building all i know is that the big cathedrals uh from the yeah sort of 12th 12th 13th centuries around there uh like chartres and rams and so on these these cathedrals were um taking easily 100 years to build so they were going over you know from 1 2 3 uh kings i would say over time certainly the kings were supporting and uh they would have their when they died those kings would then be uh their their bodies would be buried in the churches that's something i don't think we see in india oh okay that's very interesting so yeah so it no, does it be that- marked the royalty would be definitely be involved in the building of the churches yeah but then it does oh, seem yeah. that the, the catholic church was also quite uh, having its own institutional power and it had its ecclesiastical structure so it was also we don't see anything like that in india uh, so in that sense the kings probably would have greater responsibility we don't see religion institutionalized to that degree in india isn't it yeah the institutional we might call it some more, more like soft institution um yeah there's the there's one scholar of uh, godia vaishnavism um the late joseph o'connell who spoke about uh soft institution and hard institution yes um 
and he wanted to make a distinction between early Gaudiya Vaishnavism, the time of Lord Chaitanya, and uh, the next generations after Lord Chaitanya, which he identified as soft institution, and what he calls the hard institution of specifically ISKCON because of its organizational structure and so on. Um, of course, it's it's always more complicated than that, than yeah. just saying there are two categories and, and that's yeah. it. So. Um, but it, it can be helpful, I think, to think about uh, religious organization and institutions in India can be somewhat useful. That's true. So I think uh, I read about this in the Demox Chaitanya Charita Amrit, where it uh, introduced one more called medium. It's a soft core, medium core, hard core. Mm. And uh, it seems that he says that Gaudiya Amrit was a little more medium core. And mm. Iskon, in some ways, Prabhupada wanted it to be medium core, but maybe it's going toward hard core. That's his, his thesis uh-huh. because you know, Prabhupada didn't <laughs> want, say, like the finances of ISKCON to be centralized. And when they mm. tried to centralize it, Prabhupada almost suspended the GBC for some time. So, <laughs> but yeah, uh, so we were talking more about the point about the kings uh, patronizing to build temples. And that's yeah. how we have these big temples. So, so you were saying and that- those you, temples- Yeah. Those temples in South India, it may be relevant uh, that they're conceived as kind of uh, uh, models of the universe. So they're a kind of totality. Also, the cathedrals of Europe were conceived as a kind of totality. Everything is included. Uh, oh. and, and so the, the temple becomes a kind of replication of the universe. So in giving that, in, in giving charity in that way, uh, the, the king is, is replicating the universe. He's becoming also the lord of that universe, so to say. Oh, the king is becoming the lord. That's interesting. In a certain sense, but yeah. it, it's also more complicated. I can... Uh, go into more detail on this uh, af- maybe after we talk more about uh, the, the story of Vamana Dev. Yes, Maharaj. But there's an interesting connection. There's an interesting connection of Vamana Dev with one particular temple in South India. Oh. But let's, oh. let's talk about that later. Oh, okay. Sure, Maharaj. So the theme connecting was that Bali Maharaj was exhibiting characteristics that were not atypical of kings even in recent historical times. That he was uh, having pride, we could say pride channeled in a religious way or a religious pride. Mm-hmm. And that was exhibited through charity. So now, uh, some of the avatars, of the, some of the descents of the Lord, some of the... Uh, they do some things which might again cross some ethical boundaries but none of the none of the avatars the central pastime involves crossing ethical boundaries crossing ethical boundaries means not just his going from say the appearing on the devata side and helping a ending up with the side of the somebody who's opposing the devatas but his doing something morally questionable in the central pastime now, Krishna does a few things sometimes in the Mahabharata war. Now, some of Ram's actions are seen as questionable, like his killing of uh, Bali or something. But the central pastime mm-hmm. of uh, Vamanandev raises questions. So he says, in fact, not He's only does cheater. he say, Cheater. <laughs> in fact, I think the gopis... And Bali Maharaj is welcoming... Bali Maharaj is warned against that. He's fully conscious that this may be the case and he accepts it. Yeah, that's remarkable. So then one may ask, 
was this because um, Bali Maharaj is already in a mood of accepting whatever whatever the Lord does. Yes, Maharaj. So this is, you know, I had tried to read this past time and look at the Acharya's commentaries to try to understand you know, where exactly the Bali Maharaj have a change of heart. Yeah, so, I'm wondering that also. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, when he, if you just trace the past time, he's warned. He says, take as much charity as you want. And he says, I, in fact, Bali Bamandev to accentuate that, uh, you could say, cheating, he not only asks for a small thing, but then he gives a, he gives a discourse on being free from greed. And then yeah. he does exactly the opposite of that, you could say. <laughs> I will not take more than I need. <laughs> if I take more than I need, uh, this is very bad. <laughs> Yeah, so, so greed is very bad thing, and then he preaches terrible to to have greed. Yeah, to be greedy. If you take more than you need, you will be greedy. And uh, he says that if you're not satisfied with little, you will never be satisfied with much. So greed is insatiable. So that's yeah. quite a powerful discourse, and it has a lot of truths. It's just that he doesn't walk that yeah, talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. but then you can say that he does walk the talk because although he's going to take everything it's not that he holds on to it to enjoy it oh he basically gives it all to the davids right oh okay yes so even if he's say even if he's cheating it's not for his own sake so it's for someone else's sake, for the sake of those. So it's who honesty is. among. So it's honesty among thieves. <laughs> oh, we could say it's uh, it's contentment among uh, cheaters or something. Honesty among thieves. Yeah, same way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so now when he says, this, then he asks. Well, Maharaj says, "Okay, fine." So Shukracharya warns him. Now, there is also this undercurrent this about here between ritualism and spirituality. That mm. Shukracharya feels that if Bali Maharaj becomes poverty stricken, then he himself will be left without any sponsor. And ah, this is the problem. Yes, he's afraid he's going to be out of a job. <laughs> yeah. So, so he says. Don't do the don't do this. In fact, we go so far ahead saying that if you do this, you will be cursed, which is quite strong to stop someone from giving charity even to the Supreme Lord. And at that time, if you see Vamandev's motivation at this time is not spiritual. It is again at this stage also, it's still a sense of honor that I have given my word to give charity and I will never go back on my word. You mean Bali? Bali sorry, sorry, Mamale, Wali, 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 sorry. Wali. So his, his motivation is still like keeping his word of honor and maintaining his fame. He says, better I die yeah. as a, with the fame of having given charity even at a great cost rather than uh, become infamous for having back, going back on my word. So, right. so at this stage, it was like that. And then when, when the Lord expands and he covers the whole universe and then he asks him, where is the uh, you have you are still a liar where, yeah so because where uh, my third what? where we have put my third step so it seems after he gets the third step third placed step. on his head then he is uh, after that somehow his transformation starts or his transformation becomes manifested and actually it comes mm. out in his speech much later so even initially, then he says that uh, the Lord doesn't seem to accept that as a valid third step. And he says, you are like a liar. And then uh, he gets bound. He has uh, Vishnu Dutas coming over there and then he's bound. And then when the demons try to fight with, uh, they feel it is, he's been cheated. He's been, he's, he's been, so this is outrageous. So they try to attack and the Vishnu Dutas fight him off. And then he says, this is, the time is not favorable for us. So don't fight. 
it is later when brahma ji appeals on his behalf prahlad appeals on his behalf and then vaman dev speaks that is the first this is later in the 20th 21st chapters that is the first time mm. when vaman speaks something as a in a mood of a devotee he says that there are many masters Ali, sorry 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 i am getting confused or my tongue is getting confused not my mind somehow <laughs> this is repeated <laughs> speak of tongue so so bali maharaj he that's the time he says there are many masters who punish their servants but never a master is punished any servant like you have but because you are the supreme lord so i accept it i accept your will so maybe it's the touch of the feet of the lord along with the situation of complete destitution uh, which which brings about a transformation of course he is also the grandson of prahlad and prahlad's mm. prayers have been there and in prahlad's prayers he says that you know he was blinded by wealth and because you have taken away his wealth therefore now you have freed him from that blinding and thus you have done him a great favor so yes ma'am so any th- this is the rough storyline and how i understand it can you share something your thoughts on well to this to this point about when does he when is the change of heart i like to think it's a long process and that it goes back now i'm trying to remember i don't think we hear about bali maharaj specifically uh with the sagara mantana past time but just after that when the De- devas and asuras are fighting again then bali maharaj becomes prominent yes but if he is if he is among the asuras who are involved in the churning uh that suggests to me that this is the beginning of his process of purification just by virtue of the fact that the lord is present uh the lord is present there in many different forms mm. um and there must be some something going on in him as part of that process of course it's not explicit but i like to think it's there because otherwise otherwise it's hard to understand to me even though as you said it's a matter of sort of kshatriya spirit giving giving in charity and he's has this spirit of um keeping a promise and his fame and all of that but somehow beyond and above all of that it's like um for him it's like this is finally an opportunity of a clear opportunity to surrender to the lord because when shukracharya says hey don't do this because it's actually vishnu uh isn't it that uh bali mar says let it be vishnu and let me be cheated oh yes he does say that so so in one sense this is a very beautiful uh, analysis of the back story maharaj now i do remember that mm-hmm. bali maharaj is mentioned before the amrut manthan past time that means when the uh, when lord vishnu asks the devatas to form a deal with uh, the asuras for churning the milk ocean so at that time uh, indra goes weaponless to the demon side and the demons are about to attack indra but then his bali maharaj says no stop he's come on a peaceful mission and when mm. indra tells the proposal of vishnu that we can together churn the ocean and then milk ocean and we can we can get the nectar he immediately agrees so he's mentioned there but within the mohini murti past time he 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 is not mentioned as among the demons who starts fighting for the nectar and the quarreling and then getting deluded and that part is not mentioned his name doesn't come over there so but he is there uh, mm. before that also now i'm just finding the yeah 
I'm just finding where Bali Maharaj responds to Shukracharya. So it's it's interesting. He says, first he agrees with Shukracharya. This is uh, verse 2 of chapter 20. He says, as you have already stated, the principle of religion that does not hinder one's economic development, sense gratification, fame, and means of livelihood is the real occupational duty of the householder. I also think that this religious principle is correct. So he's agreeing. Yeah, he's agreeing with the uh, what is being discussed in terms of varna and ashrama. And then he says, I'm the grandson of Maharaj Prahlad. How can I withdraw my promise because of greed for money when I've already said that I shall give this land? How can I behave like an ordinary cheater, especially toward a Brahmin? So he's appealing to his relation to pra being a descendant of Prahlad, and Prahlad, of course, has uh, by this time a great um, reputation as a devotee. So that's also a matter of preparation. Um, and then he's going to elaborate on this in theme of truthfulness and untruthfulness. He's saying, if I don't give now, I will be breaking my promise. Um, so and he quotes just, Mother, he quotes Mother Earth. Yeah. I can, uh, she says, I can bear any heavy thing except a person who is a liar. Which is suggesting that Shukracharya uh, is putting himself in a position of being a liar. Yeah, that's true. Because he, he wants to incite Bali Maharaj to be a liar. Uh, even though he's given reasons, he, <laughs> he's given this funny list at the end of chapter 19 of situations in which it's appropriate and permitted to lie. Yeah, uh, a bit of a provocative list. <laughs> Strishu narma vivahe cha vrityarte prana sankate go brahmanarte hingsayang nan ritam syat jugupsitam in flattering a woman to bring her under control, in joking, in a marriage ceremony, in earning one's livelihood, when one's life is in danger in protecting cows and Brahminical culture, or in protecting a person from an enemy's hand, falsity is never condemned. Now that sounds like it's straight out of Dharma Shastra. And some years ago, I asked someone uh, who was knowledgeable of Dharma Shastra, whether it was to be found, and they found two or three references which were very close to this, very similar. Um, so, as you were saying, it's kind of the ritual side versus the spiritual side. Uh, here, the the ritual side is sort of supported by Dharma uh, Shastra, but I think it's also readable as a parody. Oh, parody, okay. Um, it's kind of, at least in the first, you know, flattering a woman to bring her under control in joking in a marriage ceremony. It's okay to lie. <laughs> <laughs> that seems a little silly. I don't know. I'm going to ask you that. The remaining part seems reasonable. Uh, yeah. I only heard or... The last four parts seem okay, but the marriage is a time of serious commitment. So I don't know, lying in the time of marriage or, or lying to control a woman. So parody makes a reasonable amount of sense here, rather than taking it as literal. Now, it just struck me, though. It says, Sri Shu, Narma Vivahe Cha. Sri Shu can also mean among women. 
Oh, okay. Isn't it? So, yeah. so women can, you know, tell little, uh, little uh, white lies to each other in the course of their socializing. That could be another way of reading it. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, so untruth and truth, this is a major issue, uh, which is certainly, it's still within the realm of dharma versus adharma. Uh, it's true that it's kind of dharma versus adharma. But for me, it's all part of his preparation uh, of surrendering. Hmm. It's it's um, his piety is showing. It's here. It's you don't get any sense of him being a demon. He's just a very pious. He might be self-centered, um, and so on. But you don't get a sense that he is uh, demonic. Yeah, at all, anywhere actually. No. So there yeah. is. Also, I think there is a general pattern in scripture that when there are certain characters who are normally considered good, if uh, they are there involved in, uh, broadly involved in a group that does something questionable, their names are not mentioned. So, for example, in the 10th canto, when uh, Samba is, Samba takes away the wife of, so the, the daughter of Duryodhana, Lakshmana, then the Kurus all attack him together and they arrest him. And then Balram says, I will go and mediate. I, I'm quite, I have a good relationship with Duryodhana. But they are, the Kauravas are angry. The Kauravas are a little arrogant with him. Now at that time, who are those Kauravas who are arrogant? Whether it is Bhishma also included in that, this it is the Kaurava said it's it's a generic reference. So right. whether it was uh, now, of course the Pandavas would not be there at that time in that, because by that time the the two groups had become quite well separated. They had their own kingdom also. But so it seems that if an overall group does something uh, which is a little off, sometimes the individual members are not mentioned in scripture if especially if they are known to be otherwise good. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> this seems to be, maybe this is in broader consonance with the fact that Eastern cultures are often quite face-saving cultures, where you give venerable people a chance to, to ensure that their honor is protected. Mm, yes, that is there. Yes, Maharaj. But there's something else, I think, um, which is sort of uh, flowing underneath all these uh, narratives. And that is that no one, although there are these classifications like uh, Deva and Asura, uh, which seem to be very black and white, the reality is otherwise. And I think that's especially highlighted in the Mahabharata. The Kauravas are generally the bad guys, but not entirely. Uh, Duryodhana is a very good ruler. Ravana is apparently a very good ruler and so on. And again, back to Bali. Bali is a very good ruler. And uh, he has some genuine sense of propriety. Mm. Oh, okay. The, the only fault, the only fault is that he is against the devas. And he, so far, he's been, you know, against the Lord. That seems to be his only fault. Oh, Okay. So yes, there are, so as compared to Hiranyakashipu, who does seem to be a, more of a monochromatically black character, hmm? we do see that uh, 
the other other demonia characters are not that black i don't know if hiranyakashipu was ruling the demons uh, equitably or just uh, virtu- properly he was definitely before he conquered everything he was destroying all over the universe and even ravan he was uh, terrorizing and conquering and plundering but lanka he kept prosperous a duryodhan as far as we know he doesn't go too much on a rampage to conquer the world during the time when he has power of course his father is still there and elder, other elders are there so we don't know what he would have done if he had uh, untrammeled power on a post power hmm but uh, yeah so that's a, and yeah please yeah. and uh, it has been argued uh, it can be argued um that in fact D- duryodhana was justified uh in being the king dhritarashtra was was justified in having his sons be the uh receiving the kingdom um since dhritarashtra was the older son he he himself was disabled by his blindness but uh it's there's a certain reasonableness to then saying still you know his sons would be the um uh, the followers um anyway my yeah. my general point is just that's true going back to bali maharaj that uh he is in process it seems to me of uh preparing to surrender to the lord and now the opportunity this wonderful opportunity has come and he's only asking for three steps of land <laughs> how easy how easy it will be now i've always wondered about this three steps of land what does that mean because um you can take three steps 1 2 3 and you have a little triangle is that what he meant by three steps of land or if you take three steps going in one direction then what would be the width what would be the width of that and furthermore why three steps why why not two why not four um and so on of course we can see that what he does with his three steps uh demonstrates but initially we may wonder why three and one thought came to me that uh three kind of in terms of grammar it indicates uh multiplicity in sanskrit dra- grammar you have the singular the dual and the plural oh okay that's striking and and uh there are very few languages that have a dual form somehow sanskrit has preserved a dual form the the slovenian the slovenian language incidentally it's a tiny country with 2 million residents uh tucked in sort of central uh south europe has a dual form <laughs> oh okay but the point is that uh as soon as you go from 2 to 3 there's there's a significant uh shift in understanding uh if you think just in terms of numbers we speak of duality you know the duality of heat and cold happiness and distress mm. uh we don't we of course we can speak about degrees of happiness and distress but when you add a third principle then you have the multiplicity of the world and perhaps therefore we have three modes of nature but in china they have the chinese tradition has yin and yang uh just the two principles and they see everything as being a mixture of these two somehow two doesn't seem like enough for for our tradition there has to be three and then three is multiplicity and perhaps for that reason it's a 
uh, it's a totality so that when, uh, when Vamana Dev expands and takes his three steps and becomes Trivikrama, uh, then uh, he is indeed encompassing, he is encompassing everything. It's not only the totality of the universe in a physical sense, but also in a conceptual sense. It, it is the... Uh, it is the, vishesh, the the multiplicity which is reality that's being encompassed by the Lord. In contrast to the singularity, you know, the, the near vishesha, the non-dual uh, principle, it's the multiplicity principle, uh, which to me is indicated by three steps simply by virtue of the, the numbering. And if you think in terms of grammar, three is significant as being significantly more than two. <laughs> mm. And it indicates multiplicity sufficiently. You don't need to talk about four and five and six. Three is sufficient. Grammatically speaking, three indicates uh, plural. Oh, that's quite a profound analysis. And, you know, I love this. I don't know. Because if, if I think about it, we could even say that the Lord doesn't even have to ask for three steps. He could just ask for one step and he could have expanded one step to encompass everything also, if he had wanted. So, yeah, he could, he could just expand it. He did as expand his size, but he could have expanded his size itself to cover everything. So it's interesting that he asked three steps and um, talk going, going to your point about physical and conceptual. So it seems that he spans the universe, the physical universe in two steps. And it's a, the third step is more to ask like a more of a, uh, not just the surrender of possessions, but the surrender of one's uh, subtle body or one's physical body and one's entire being. So yeah. we offer what we have and then we offer not only what we have, but who we are, which is a deeper level of surrender. And yes, so, that's surrendering oneself, Atmani Vedana. Yes. <laughs> That's, that's the full surrender. And that must be the reason why Bali Maharaj is included uh, among the Mahajans, isn't it? Yes. He is an authority on, on bhakti. Why, why is he an authority? Because he gave not just everything, but he gave himself. Yes, that's true. So another, another point is that he is not just... Uh... One of the Mahajanas, he's also the exemplar of that last limb of the bhakti, Shravanam Kirtana Vishnu, Atma Nivedanam. He is considered the exemplar of that. Aha, uh -huh. so it is Atma Nivedana yeah. that he represents. Very good. Yes, so, <clears throat> yeah. Now, I was thinking to share with you something I came across connecting Vamana Dev to. Well, to history in a way, uh, which oh, okay. I find interesting. Um, it's, we can say also it's art history. So there's one temple in Kanchipuram. Uh, it's a quite modest size, size temple. It's called the Vaikuntha Peramal, uh, the, the house of Vishnu. And the temple is, has the shape of a pyramid. It's, um, it's a bit different from most of the South Indian temples. And it was built in uh, the late 8th century. And it was, uh, it was built um, by one king named... Nandi Varman Pallavamala. Is this any of the one Maharaj? 
Yes, that's the temple. Very good. Uh, I couldn't have been all. Yes. Okay. Can make one full screen. Yeah. I'm trying to look at it. Oh, it's a small screen image itself. So, oh, anyway. Okay. It's going to YouTube. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. coming. Yeah. No. <laughs> Here, holiday landmark. Where yeah. So. So you notice on these pictures, uh, there are many, many sculptures. Yeah. And it turns out, it turns out that the sculptures which are on the pyramid, uh, the, the main temple structure itself, um, are all, uh, they are all descriptive of pastimes in the Bhagavatam. Oh, okay. And all of what you're showing here, these uh, these uh, images in the uh, courtyard, basically, these are all telling the history mm, of this king, Nandivarman Pallavamala. Now, Nandivarman Pallavamala mm. was not from a regular... Uh, Varna like Kshatriya background rather it seems that he was brought to India from Southeast Asia oh okay by, by uh, some people uh, to be their king and to legitimize him he underwent Pancharatra initiations. And this entire temple is in effect documenting uh, this uh, process. It's, it's a process of initiation that he went through. Now, how do I know all this? Because there is one book uh, which was the product of 25 years of research by one uh, American scholar uh, named um, Dennis Hudson. And he wrote a book, I'm just getting the name, called The Body of God, An Emperor's Palace for Krishna in 8th Century Kanchipuram. And this book describes in great detail uh, one after another of the sculptures in this temple with elaborate explanation, uh, not only about the stories behind the images, but also as an analysis of just why each panel, each image, uh, or bas-relief sculpture is positioned where it is uh, in terms of directions, in terms of relation to the rest of the structure, the rest of the building. Uh, and so mm, when it comes to his discussion about the sculpture of Vamana Dev, there are th three sculptures. One is Vamana Dev, the next is Trivikrama, and then is an uh, image showing Bali Maharaj surrendering to Trivikrama. Oh, okay. And, and this um, Professor Hudson, the late Professor Hudson, he, he actually died before he finished this book, and then some friends finished it for him. Uh, it's published by Oxford University Press. It's explained that um, Nandi Varman is represented uh, or 
Bali Maharaj represents the king, Nandi Varman, and Vamana Dev represents Nandi Varman's Acharya, his, his guru. Oh, okay. And he, he identifies five ways in which uh, there is correspondence. So I'll just um, go through these. So, Bali and Nandi Varman share an analogous ritual status. Asuras are analogous to Shudras, and Nandi Varman is a Shudra king. According to the laws of Manu, he is a Malla and a Dravida, and both Mallas and Dravidas once were Kshatriyas, but now are Shudras. Okay. That's according to Manu Samhita, apparently. That's interesting. And he gives a reference for that. Yeah. So it seems there's mobility across the castes. There's some rituals have to be done. So historically... Specifically go... Pancharatra. Okay. This is where Pancharatra actually... I, I, we get a lot of understanding of what Pancharatra is uh, from this book. Okay. Uh, it's a way of facilitating bringing people into, into the fold, which is how we are engaged in the <clears throat> ISKCON mission today. It's very much uh, linked to Pancharat. Second, Bali has a Brahman nature imparted to him by the Brigus and owns the whole world. Analogously, Nandi Varman has been consecrated according to the rites of the Northern Sequence and owns the entire Pallava realm. The Northern Sequence, this is uh, something he explains elsewhere in the book. Uh, but it's, as I understand, it's tied with the path of the Devas as opposed to the Asuras. Oh, Bali is a is devoted to Brahmins and to Vishnu, so is Nandi Varman. Bali knows that in the context of his sacrifice, Vishnu is disguised as Vamana. Nandi Varman similarly knows that in the context of his sacrifice, Vishnu is described is disguised as his Acharya. <laughs> oh, okay. And and finally, Vishnu disguised as a Brahman called Uttama Shloka, receives Bali's promised gift, the entire world. Similarly, Vishnu, disguised as the Brahman Acharya, receives Nandi Varman's promised gift, the entire Pallava realm. Oh, okay. That's fascinating. So he's the ruler of the Pallava kingdom, and he, in effect, gives his kingdom to his Acharya. Anyway, I just thought that is um, interesting. It's so, uh, this is a... part of a much bigger explanation, of course, of this whole temple complex and uh, what, what this king was doing to sort of uh, docu document his life and his position. Oh, okay. Now, now when he says his Acharya is his, like his Vishnu, is that referring uh, literally or is it more like a representative Vishnu? Or that's not mentioned so clearly? I don't think he elaborates so much on that. Okay. Um, there's, there's a certain sense of oneness and difference, you know. <laughs> yeah, that is true. But uh, yeah, it's interesting that there's a the idea of reenactment of a transcendental pastime in history. And uh, yes, well, we get this not only as reenactment, uh, but in in Rajasthan, I read this quite some time ago, but uh, it's been shown by one scholar that uh, the uh, the Jaipur kings one the I believe the the king uh, at the time of um, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur and Baladeva Divushana when 
when Baladev came to um, have that debate in the, it would have been the 18th century, that uh, the king, what was his name? One of the Jaipur Man Singh, kings. Jai Singh? Um, yeah, I think he was one of the Jai Singhs. He was presenting himself as, um, as being Kalki Avatar. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> that's all you can say. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so his, his whole program was uh, apparently to say, you know, I am saving. Kali Yuga is now coming to an end because now I'm here. <laughs> Uh -huh. And he was demonstrating, part of his demonstrating that was uh, showing his concern that proper religious principles were being followed. And therefore, he was concerned uh, that uh, proper worship was going on in uh, the Radha Govinda temple. And therefore, because there was criticism uh, from, from who was it, the Ramanandis? Ramana and this, yes. Uh, so he he had he called in the Godias to have this debate. Oh. So yeah, king identifying themselves as um, avatars or somehow expansions of avatars is going on. Okay. Now this brings up another subject which I thought is interesting in this pastime. In, but before that, when we go back to the Sagara Mantana, the Amrita Mantana Lila, we have several, what I call, divine interventions. Yes. Uh, the, the Devas and Asuras are trying to churn, and before that, they, they're trying to bring the mountain uh, and, you know, they break down, they, some of them are crushed. Then, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun, the Lord comes and saves them. He lifts Mandara Mountain <clears throat> uh, and so on. One after another, uh, there's about five or six interventions in that pastime. Yeah. Uh, Ajita on top, he comes and yes. holds the mountain from above. And yeah, that's, yeah. Yes, that's true. And Kurma and and uh, um, and Mohini Murti and so on. Yes. So so these we can call divine interventions. Now I want to suggest that uh, with Vamana Dave we may have an example of a divine disruption. That's beautiful. Okay. Because uh, he is coming. The situation is that Bali Maharaj is performing a yagya. Yagya is this very strictly formalized ritual procedure. Uh, and uh, it, mm, it bears no interruptions, except perhaps if a Brahmin comes and asks for charity. Then, okay, we stop and we give in charity, but otherwise nothing, nothing can stop. When Krishna, when Krishna's friends go to uh, beg alms from the Yagyak Brahmins and they say, basically, don't disturb us, we're performing Yagya, it's because uh, they're not allowing any disruption to be made. In the Daksha Yagya, there's a huge disruption, and we can call it a divine disruption. In that case, because Lord Shiva, simply by sitting and not responding, becomes a huge disruption. <laughs> and it's a, it's a disruption of the ritual universe we can say. Disruption and when disruption Vamana comes, ability. when Vamana comes, he's also disrupting, but in a very, very sweet way, 
which is not, um, yeah, it's, it's absolutely not violent, um, but it's still a disruption because in the end, whereas initially uh, Bali Maharaj is going to be giving in measured way, because what is sacrifice? It's giving to the fire, Agni, in very measured ways, what represents giving oneself, but is actually uh, giving so many substitutes for oneself. Now, when Vamanadev comes, uh, he says, give me please three steps of land. And, um, and Bali Maharaj says, sure, why not? I'm happy to give you three steps of land. He is now ready to um, actually give himself Atmani Vedana, but he's not going to give it in the ritual. He's going to give to Vamana Dev. And Vamana forces him to do it because Bali doesn't know how else to, to give himself fully. So Bali Maharaj helps him out. But <laughs> by, by saying, where am I going to put my third step? You've made a promise. Okay, put it on my head. Um, so it's a very wonderful kind of disruption, a divine divine disruption, which, as you said, is boundary crossing. It's, um, it's collapsing, we can say, all the boundaries. But it's preserving one boundary, and that is there are two principles. There's the Lord and there's the Lord's devotee. It's not merging Bali Maharaj with Vamanadi. Mm. And then there's a reversal of roles. Uh, when Bali Maharaj uh, is, um, sorry, when Vamana becomes, isn't it the now I'm getting mixed the, the up. Door he becomes the, the doorkeeper. Door Vamana, is it? Vamana becomes the doorkeeper for Bali Maharaj? Yes, Maharaj, the Dwarpal. The Dwarpal. The Dwarpal. So then there's a reversal of, of order. So it seems the mood, my voice is echoing through something. Okay, not now. I don't know. Okay, so it seems that his mood is that you know, your kingdom was stolen earlier, but now I will ensure that nobody ever steals the kingdom from you. Never, nobody ever steals anything from you. I'll be your doorkeeper. So he's a doorkeeper, yes. he's a protector. He is... I'll be your doorkeeper, but your kingdom will be contained. It will be limited. You are the lord of, what is it, Sutala? Sutala, yes. Um, but nothing more than that. Okay. But then it is also said that Sutala is more, in some ways, more opulent than even the heavens. So it's not a, exactly a loss. No loss. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's a story with a happy ending. <laughs> yeah, very happy ending. In one sense, again, this echoes the theme of, uh, say, material victory and spiritual victory being two separate things. Like in the sixth canto of Rutrasur, he is materially defeated, but he's spiritually victorious. And Indra, he is materially victorious, but he doesn't really become much elevated in his devotion. So uh, Indra has the Lord with him initially as Upendra, as his younger brother. But then at by the end of the pastime, he has the kingdom, but he he loses the he, he doesn't have the Lord with him by his side. On the other hand, uh, Vaman Nadev, he had the kingdom initially, practical universe, but then he didn't have the Lord. By the end of the past time, he has the Lord and he also has a, okay. has a part of the kingdom, part of the universe. He has a kingdom. So, yes. So, Indra is materially victorious and Vamana is, in one sense, not materially a failure, but he's spiritually victorious and he's materially also, he gains something. So, it's he like... He has nothing... He has nothing to complain about. Yes. So it's on, <laughs> only like a in the face when he's going through that, when he seems to have lost everything and he's bound 
and even the demon start uh, going against him his priest goes his shukracharya goes against him that's like a dark phase so something like the dark night of the soul or he has to go through that but then there is a happy ending yes now i have a question maybe you can help me with this we understand that vamana dev is uh the supreme personality of godhead he's bhagavan uh all of the avatars are bhagavan the supreme personality of godhead uh and we always emphasize the personality or personhood of the lord and mm. we understand we are his part and parcels we are similarly uh in quality non different we are also persons so if we take this category of personhood what do we learn about personhood from vamana dev in what ways does the pastime of vamana dev um expand our understanding of what is a person <laughs> this is a genuine question this is not a trick or a uh it's not i don't have a pat answer i'm actually wondering how can we how can we think about this how can we whether it's vamana or any of the other uh forms of the lord is they're all coming to um reestablish dharma to um to punish the uh non devotees to protect the devotees but if we're thinking of the lord understanding he is the supreme person so he is the complete fullness of personhood then we must be able to learn something about personhood from each of his appearances Does that make any sense? That's beautiful. I never thought of it that way. <laughs> it, Maybe it's it, just something to leave in the air to think about. <laughs> yeah, you know, we can definitely to see in terms of Krishna Lila that his sense of personhood as a small child is so endearing, and in fact, he, in a sense, subordinates his godhood so that he can have reciprocations of love. so the devotees know mm-hmm. he is god but they don't i mean they don't consciously stay aware of it so that they can reciprocate love and his personality is so multifaceted but uh, if we want to learn from each avatar that would be interesting now i if i mean in just this direction i was i didn't think of in this direction but i was going to explore this point that uh, you know if you talk about personality people are complex like we ourselves mm-hmm. we may know we may think we know someone and then they behave in a very surprising or shocking way and say i did i really know this person and that applies to us also sometimes we act in unexpected ways sometimes unexpectedly good some sometimes unexpectedly bad so personality is itself quite complex and in one sense vamana dev exhibits that complexity of personality and at one level he says that i am not i uh, am not greedy i don't want anything i just want something and then he does something else so it's like he has uh, layers of uh, layers to his personality or layers to his reasons for doing things like we say lord chaitanya has external internal reasons for his appearance so that's mm-hmm. like layers of uh, so similarly his external reason is that he is going to uh, restore the kingdom to indra and that's what he is acting for explicitly he comes from indra after being with indra being felicitated by him and but he has a internal purpose going on he wants to he wants to deliver bali and not only deliver bali but then he wants to be with bali so mm. so that 
with respect to personality that multi that m- multiple things being happening or multiple purposes being served i think that's mm. aphorism vedic aphorism that lord does many things through one action so mm. he is delivering indra at the level indra can appreciate but then he is delivering uh, bali maharaj to a far higher level of consciousness so yeah that complexity of uh, uh, personality that's one thing i can think of am i, am I in the direction no, that you were asking or you had something else yes it's a, it's a, i think it's a good direction um and i like your point about uh vamana de wanting to be with bali maharaj uh which suggests that uh the <clears throat> the reciprocation of bhakti is already before we come to krishna we're seeing this with uh with vamana dev that uh he's actually having a motivation we can say of he wants he wants to draw out bali maharaj's devotion because he will enjoy that devotion he will reciprocate reciprocate with that devotion and it becomes mutual uh a, a mutual affection that's beautiful so um, just a quick point with respect to this it seems this is the hmm. among the few avatars who stays for a long time the narsimha dev just comes yeah. and disappears and i think that's how it happens for most of the other avatars we don't really know where what happens to matsya or kurma or afterward there is no make, like a disappearance past time or something like that in general most of the yeah. previous avatars don't have a disappearance past time but it's clear that they are not around for a long time but bali does yes. seem, but bali does seem to get the association of vamana for a long time and in some of the later literatures or some of the later retellings of the ramayana it is said that even uh, when ravan wanted to gain some wealth he tried to meet vaman at that time bali maharaj he tried to meet bali maharaj at that time vaman was still door keeper so it seems he was there for a very long time hmm hmm now i i have another question maharaj um, just one minute when you ask the question i'm sure you must have had some thoughts about that personhood So would you like uh, to share whatever thoughts you had? Oh, um well I can't say very much really because um it's it's just the beginning you can say of a what may be a, a longer uh a longer investigation. Actually I have my notes here but um according to one scholar uh of christian tradition this is a um in say christian theology she is uh linda trinkhaus agzebski uh wrote a book called divine well i forget the title of the book but here she's talking about divine motivation theory it's called and specifically here talking what is what is a person and she gives five uh features of personhood a person has a rational nature meaning has capacities of reason and choice and she points out this is going a step uh significantly further than aristotle who considered the ultimate reality the unmoved mover mm. so having rational nature second a person possesses subjectivity um which another way of saying that is having self awareness uh and so god is fully conscious of himself a third principle is a person has relationships with other persons a fourth is a person is free and a fifth principle is <clears throat> that a person is what is called in 
communicable. And what that means is that you cannot just replace one person with another person uh, because they are, every single person is unique. Um, so in a technical way, this is said, that which distinguishes a person from an instance of a nature. Oh, okay. So you, you don't, we are not just instances of a nature. We are more than that. We are persons. Now about relationships with other persons, that's something we emphasize a lot. We say, you know, bhakti is about relationship with the Lord. Uh, the Lord um, is a person. We are persons. There is relationship. But in the particular context in which I'm reflecting on this is with respect to our understanding of non-human beings, animals, because I want to, I think I want to argue uh, that animals are not only sentient and they're not only atma, self, but they are persons. And um, I, I'm, this is just beginning stages. I haven't thought about this enough yet and haven't read enough yet, um, but uh, it may be some preliminary work for, uh, for a book, which would be a follow-up to the book I wrote about cows. <laughs> and that's why I'm asking, what do we learn about personhood from Vamanadev. And you've answered one nice point. There is complexity. Uh, we may say complexity of purpose. So it's not a singular, simple purpose, but a complex. Anyway, so that's nice. Oh, so complexity of purpose might fall within relationships, like different relationships with different people. If you, mm, if you want to take yeah. that five-fold framework. Yeah. That's fascinating. And in a sense, we could, just thinking in that way, uh, the Lord might always, Lord, of course, all his manifestations are persons, but within the way he's manifested, the personhood itself is seen much more in certain avatars or certain manifestations like Krishna or Ram then say, for example, in uh, Matsya or Kurma or even Varaha, like we discussed, Varaha speaks. Yeah. Uh, Kurma doesn't really seem to speak also from what, as far as we can see. And yeah. Matsya, there is some speaking initially, but it's very, very preliminary. So, yeah. so personhood itself is manifested more. It, may, it, it is latent always there, but... Mm. So in Vamana, personhood is manifested quite a bit in terms of uh, the way he is reciprocating with different people. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. So one other question I have Just is... Just one, one minute before I move forward. You know, Ishwar okay. Krishna Prabhu or uh, Ithamar Theodore, he has written hmm. a book. I think you work with him quite often. I, at least I think you are working some of your teaching in China and other places. So... He has talked about these evolving conceptions of personhood in the Bhagavatam and mm -hmm. cultivating in culminating in Krishna. So, yeah. so Vamana seems to be, if we consider the Bhagavatam's descriptions of the avatars, so it's uh, it's roughly in the sequence of the Dasha avatars, not necessarily entirely. But if we consider the eighth canto is Vaman Dev, ninth canto is Lord, uh, Lord Ramachandra and Parshuram. And then 10th canto is Krishna. So mm. there is a progression in the description of the avatars and, uh, and also the level of personhood manifested by them with Krishna manifesting right. the most. Uh, well, this is going to be, this is going to raise questions perhaps about um, our next avatar, which I think is Parashuram. Yes. <laughs> Because <laughs> he seems to act in very wild ways. <laughs> wild, yeah. 
That's true. Anyway, uh, I just have one more thought or question maybe to reflect on. We see with Nrsinghadev, uh, the worship of Nrsingha is very popular um, in our in our own ISKCON society, the Vaishnavas, we, we are inspired to pray to Nrsinghadev for protection uh, for ourselves, for our community, for our mission, and so on. Um, with Vamana Dev, I don't know, I don't think there's, maybe there's some, but there don't seem to be many temples dedicated to Vamana Dev. And we don't seem to hear much about, you know, prayer, uh, about worshiping, uh, to, wor offering worship to Vamana Dev in the same way that we offer worship to Nrsinghe or Lord Ram. So, um, of course, we can say the same about Varaha, Matsya, Kurma. We don't see a lot of worship of them. But because Vamana is, as you were just saying, kind of a step further from Nrsinghadev, one might expect uh, to be a, another additional level of worship going on, but we don't seem to see that. Yeah, that's interesting. And then if we see that way, Parshuram also is not worshipped. He's venerated, he is respected, feared also. but. Mm. Even we don't see too many temples for Parshuram also. So, yeah, it, uh, <laughs> it does seem, you could say, from the perspective of history, history of religion, maybe there mm. are particular contextual reasons why particular, uh, particular manifestations of divine start getting worshipped and others mm. don't. Maybe there's a pattern king who starts worshipping a particular manifestation of the Lord and then that goes on and perpetuates. Of course, that's a mundane reason. But uh, at least in Maharashtra, we see a lot of Ganesh worship. And that has uh, we could have historical mm. reasons at a particular time. Some prominent Maharashtrian leaders started recommending that worship yeah. as a way of uniting people. And yeah. uh, so there is that level of... So maybe it's time to start promoting. Maybe it's time to start promoting worship of Vamana Dev. Yeah. Considering that there are some powerful rulers who could be helped uh, in their spiritual progress if they would get opportunity to surrender to the Lord <laughs> as, <laughs> as Vamana, something. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's an amazing thought. Uh, just uh, to carry on this thread, Maharaj, that like uh, what a, Bali Maharaj is very, at one level, respectful or of Vedic culture, but then there is the rising from ritual to, we could call it spiritual at one level. But while the Bhagavatam uh, raises from ritual to spiritual, it doesn't uh, reject the ritual in the sense that mm. there is no condemnation of Shukracharya at the end of the pastime. In fact, mm. uh, when the Vamande meets with uh, Shukracharya, he asks him, because still consider him like an expert, what was wrong with uh, Bali Maharaj's sacrifice? What went wrong? And then he has that famous verse, Mantra Tantra Chidram, that any sacrifice, however faulty it might be, if the names of the Lord are chanted, then it's all auspicious. So, mm. Shukracharya also is not, in a sense, depicted in any uncharitable way over here. He's, hmm. he's also shows, is shown to be having devotional wisdom. And in general, the Bhagavatam, even when it shows Brahmanas doing uh, things which are unbrahminical, it doesn't condemn the institution of Brahmanas per se. Even when right. they do something wrong, still they are to be respected. That's what it yeah. shows. But well, it's like respect, respect them, but don't restrict, restrict your spirituality to them. Something like that. Yes. Respect them and put them in perspective. Mm. 
that seems to be what's happening when, again, uh, Krishna's friends go to the yogic brahmins. Um, yes. They're sort of put into perspective. As you say, they're not completely condemned. In fact, they condemn themselves but because they condemn themselves, they're actually redeeming themselves. Beautiful. Yeah. By condemning themselves, they're redeeming themselves. And it seems Vishwanath Chikadakur says that, uh, the, how did they get that realization by the time when their wives come back? That they're condemning themselves. That, so it seems their sacrifice is successful and the devtas come and the devtas tell them, you are such fools. You are doing sacrifices for us, but... Our Lord had come to you and you didn't give offer him anything. So it is that's what gives them that uh, realization. That's his uh, explanation. So that the very fact that Devutas came and gave them an explanation and gave them that understanding, that also indicates that they are not to be condemned. That they're given an opportunity for redeeming themselves and they do the redeem themselves in that sense. Yeah. Mm. So, now does Bali Maharaj after that still have Shukracharya as his priest? That's I don't think that's oh. not mentioned uh, much in the not last chapters of the canto, where yeah. it's just mentioned that the con so the conclusion is like uh, if we say happily ever after, there are not many details of the ever after after that. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Yes, Maharaj. So, anyway, it's a very rich pastime. It's um, sort of re reviewing the pastime of Vamana Dev um, makes me appreciate him more. Um, and uh, thinking of how he, he is, of course, a divine uh, shapeshifter, like some of the others, Matsya and Varaha. Um, but he is um, he's showing this mm, effort, how the Lord makes wonderful effort uh, to facilitate surrender. He, he's, he makes a very sweet invitation. And then there's, that's all, and all that Bali Maharaj has to do is, um, is agree. He makes his promise, right? He pours, I guess he pours the water indicating that he's making a promise. And then that's all, that, all he has to do. And the Lord does the rest. Mm. Um, and then the only, the only th one more thing that Bali Maharaj has to do when, uh, you know, it looks like he's in trouble, as you said, the Vishnu has come, they're tying him up. All he has to do is bow down. <laughs> said, yeah. put your foot on my head. So it's, it's bow down, mister. That's beautiful. Which, which ties the whole pastime in a way back to the process of archana in which uh, the actually the final of the 16 upacharas is pranam, pranam to offer obeisance. Mm. It comes uh, after welcoming, receiving, um, offering a seat, padyam, argyam, achmaniyam, and so on. Um, then the, uh, the final item is prana, pranati, prana, offering obeisance. So that's what Bali Maharaj does. Hmm. Now just to take this from the other perspective, is that you know, in one sense, while the Lord created the setting for surrender, there is this, uh, just to take a parallel, like when Prabhupada came to America, in one sense, Prabhupada came at the right time when there was a cultural ferment. There's also a time when uh, there's, a, I think some one academic scholar has uh, 
and satyaraj was written an article about this at how the counter culture was a time when there was a receptivity to eastern spirituality at that time there were mm. political changes by which the immigration laws were relaxed and vatican ii had just happened because of which uh, the the christianity had also become open to other religions so in a sense prabhupada was setting the stage krishna was setting the stage for prabhupada at the same time it is uh, prabhupada's expertise that he danced so well so it's not taking anything away from prabhupada's greatness to consider the historical context in which uh, how the historical context was was ripe for prabhupada's uh, mess- message and mission to spread so i mean that yeah. that's a principle similarly in one sense mm. while the lord makes surrender for wali uh, wali maharaj he uh, he gets creates a setting but that doesn't take any credit from bali maharaj in one sense we could say bali maharaj uh, has at one level every reason to be angry with the lord you know you cheated mm. me you said you wanted yeah. three steps you and you on top of that you gave a discourse on not being greedy and now just see how greedy you are so <laughs> at one level he has every reason to reject a lord who is who who means almost like double deals like that and yet he doesn't do and on top of that his teacher is telling him to reject the lord so he and has every he, reason to reject and he doesn't reject i think prabhupada talks about that and he rejects as, his guru yeah he rejects his guru and prabhupada says i think in the connection with relationship with the gopis love for krishna that real love is when there is every reason for a relationship to end and still the relationship doesn't end it's i think from bhakti <laughs> sutras so so here it's uh, bali maharaj surrender is is incredible that uh, so the lord very amazingly create this facility for him to surrender the setting and then he he also gloriously surrenders in that setting so we could appreciate mm. both of them from that perspective and the lord is having a good time the whole time <laughs> yeah a good time the whole time that's true and just one observation i had maybe before we yeah go to the conclusion that you know in the past in the prayers that are offered by different personalities like brahma offers prayers and prahlad offers prayers so their prayers seem to be that there is a substantial difference between them so brahma ji is praying my dear lord you are satisfied just by offering a little tulsi and bali has offered everything you know be be satisfied with him and prahlad seems to be praying that uh, you know he you are so merciful to him so the brahma's emphasis is you are merc- if you are merciful please release him now it's enough but prahlad seems to be appreciating that you know you are so merciful that although there was some devotional inclination but he was blinded by pride because of his opulence now by taking away his opulence you have let his devotion manifest of course i'm paraphrasing the prayers but uh, so there is we could also if you want to trace back there could also be the influence of prahlad and his presence in his life which would also have created some devotional appreciation and inclination in bali maharaj yes that was that i was uh trying to suggest earlier that uh the bali bali maharaj's journey to surrender uh begins with his being the grandson of prahlad maharaj and appreciating that uh honoring his grandfather hmm that's true so so there is a we could say there might be one dramatic moment when that transformation manifests but before that dramatic moment to come up there is a long history behind it exactly <laughs> yes maharaj so now in is to maybe just to as a concluding reflection you know we also see like in our acquaintances or even in our outreach with our relatives like people don't seem to be receptive or interested in bhakti and then suddenly something happens and they become so serious in fact they sometimes seem mm-hmm. to be remarkably serious more serious than somebody who might be in have been around for years so there is often a lot working so it's something like krishna says that somebody has practiced bhakti in a previous life 
or practice spiritual pursued spirituality it gets covered and then at what point it will get manifest it's it's difficult to predict but when it gets manifest it's like they take off from the point where they were earlier not from point 0 so we're not talking yeah. about bali maharaj having a previous life history of bhakti but that point of dramatic transformation that we also see sometimes in in our outreach and we can't really pinpoint you know this incident brought about this transformation but we do see it happens sometimes at a particular time so there is a big history behind it maybe extending to a previous life also but then it's wonderful to see the transformation happening whenever and however it happens whenever and however it happens it's wonderful yes <laughs> <laughs> and it's so it's those moments that we um uh, it's those moments that make it all worthwhile that make make our efforts in serving lord chaitanya all worthwhile isn't it yes my so that's the thing nothing gives fulfillment of that level hmm and we see it <laughs> you know, that the soul comes to krishna and maybe we played some small part in it hmm small small part Small, small. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. Thank you. <coughs> so, should I try to summarize, Maharaj? Please, it's it's time for your summary. Thank you. So, I think we started today by looking at some striking features of the past time before we went into it. So, one theme that came up was of crossing over. So, Bali Maharaj is a somebody who starts off almost like a demon. but then becomes a devotee rutrasura is like that but rutrasura doesn't have a personal relationship with a particular manifestation who has also appeared and we a significant part of our talk was tracing bali maharaj's uh, transformation but before we went that then you mentioned that even vaman dev is crossing over because he at one level physically crosses over and extends into the entire universe and then he crosses over from indra's side to bali maharaj's side to be with him uh eternally uh, or for as long as sutala is there and as, then we discussed about when the transformation happens in bali maharaj so it's in his own words it is way late when he is expressing that you know you you have punished me like no no one has ever punished anyone but you are merciful oh lord that's in the 22nd chapter in the 21st 22nd chapters but before that he traces back that it is right in the amrut manthan churning ocean that he is contacted the lord in his many manifestations and that has its seed that that has its influence and he is at one level a very honorable uh, kshatriya he used the word imperialist is expansionist but there is no evil tendency in him and he has religious pride in giving charity and maintaining a reputation of being charitable and then we had this discussion about the south indian king uh, what can kanchipur what is his name shantivarman yes kanchipur kanchipuram uh, nandivarman nandivarman pallavamala nandi nandivarman <laughs> so right guys south indian names are quite difficult to remember but you have got that name yeah. uh-huh. <laughs> so nandivarman so so it seems there's like a reenactment of that of the past time of vamana and bali in his life with his as he considers his acharya to be like vamana and his architecture over there so it seems there's, there's a very well researched uh, temple and you said that it also shows some kind of upward mobility or mobility across the caste across the varanas through pancharatra and the krishna mm. consciousness movement is in some ways carrying on that mission of elevating people beyond conventional varanashram boundary uh, uh, stratas and then we also discussed about the fact that how is personhood manifested so one thing is that he is there is a complexity of levels of uh, motivations externally he is fulfilling the prayer for which he has been sought restoring the kingdom of uh, kingdom for the devtas so also that time earlier we discussed that this is also a past time which blurs material and spiritual boundaries that the lord is sought for material help and he does come so however we call the lord that is auspicious and then he does more than what he is called for 
so he gives himself to vaman dev while he gives the kingdom to bali and vaman dev surrender is that so, so sorry uh, bali so that was about the historical discussion and then also you mentioned that how the you know, kings had this religious pride of building temples and at the time of bali maharaj it seems to be more of having huge sacrifices and through it all the lord is personally creating a setting for vaman dev for bali maharaj to surrender that he has to he makes it there is some latent devotion in his heart but it's not being expressed and by creating that setting where he can he can he can surrender that the lord very lovingly arranges for that reciprocation then from bali maharaj's perspective he he's the grandson of prahlad so that also is a devotional influence and he rejects his guru although the so that's also a tension between ritual and spiritual and the bhagavatam while showing how the ritual is inadequate doesn't condemn it the shukracharya is still treated respectfully but is now but the you have to see it in perspective and see the bigger picture also and then toward the end we discussed about how you know, on one side if we have vaman dev creating a setting for bali maharaj surrender another is bali maharaj surrendering there is everything that he could have said you didn't walk your talk you said you are be content and you are being greedy but still he doesn't reject the lord he embraces he embraces that opportunity and then after going through a dark phase where it seems everything is lost he gains he everything almost materially and spiritually he gets a place more opulent than heaven and then he gets something transcendently greater than heaven that is the lord himself so he gives up this kingdom and he gives himself to the lord and the lord gives the kingdom back and the lord gives himself to to bali maharaj so it's as you said toward the conclusion it's a very rich past time with lots of um, lots of levels which we can analyze and relish and you also mentioned that maybe it is time that we we popularize the worship of vaman dev so that some kings can also be redeemed by that surrendering to him yes maharaj anything kings else and, kings and uh, other sorts of leaders other so yeah today's leaders yes maharaj today's leaders generally they're not kings but there's something that anyway yes yes maharaj. um we also talked a little about divine disruption oh yeah beautiful yeah is divine the a normal word you use for us divine intervention with respect to the amrit manthan but in this case yes. there is a divine disruption of the ritual order like happened in the daksha past time also so yeah that's beautiful but it is a very sweet non violent disruption which, yes so very the lord sweet. is coming as a brahmana here and although he doesn't fight but he does uh, he does act to settle political issues without fighting yeah yes maharaj in a very brahminical way he does it <laughs> yes maharaj so the the so the conclusion especially with prahlad maharaj uh prahlad maharaj's influence when so we are talking i think conclusion is that we also see sometimes people dramatically transformed so there is a long history behind it and mm. we we may play a very small small part but still seeing that transformation gives us a great fulfillment it makes all that we do worthwhile when we are trying to share bhakti yes maharaj yes yes it it reminds us that we are also um the 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 light of the sun of krishna is also shining on us whenever oh. whenever we see that krishna surya sam maya hoy on the card yeah it's maybe shining on us and shining through us also for some others to be attracted and and shining through exactly yes maharaj so thank you very okay. much for sharing your insights and sharing it's like almost thank encyclopedic you. scope of uh, you know we integrated historical religious scholarship with uh, say a devotional contemplation on the on lord vaman dev is a remarkable discussion thank you maharaj yes, yes we are churning we are churning the ocean of of krishna leela yes maharaj <laughs>
Thank okay. you. Until next time. Next time is uh, Parashuram. Huh? Yes, Maharaj. Parashuram. Thank you. Okay. Ambalavisa. Or Prayananda Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. Thank you.